She had come to me on the advice of a mutual friend who also worshiped in our congregation. The purpose of her appointment with me was unclear. We had a pleasant, wandering conversation. She told me about the shenanigans of her small children, about frustrations at her work, about the difficulty of dealing with aging parents. We talked about everything, everything, but the one thing she had come to talk about. Every time I probed a little bit to ask her more about her home life and about the man with whom she lived, we changed the subject just like that. So I knew that's what she had come to talk about. I can't imagine how difficult it was for her to tell a stranger, even a kind stranger in a clerical collar, what her life was really like. But finally she did. And what was her life like? She was frightened. Frightened all the time. Frightened of this man with whom she lived, of his rages, of his threats, of his erratic behavior. She cried as she talked, her head bent low like the woman in today's gospel reading, watching like a hawk the wet Kleenex in her hand. When she finished, we were silent for a long time, and I said, what do you need? She stuffed the tissue in her pocket, squared her shoulders, and said, I need to go home. And she did. We never spoke again. I never saw her again. Though I learned from our mutual friend that she once moved out of the house and then moved back in, that they had another child, that she moved out of the house and then back in. Some of you know this song far too well. I wondered why she would keep going back, returning to a home that might not have been safe. I talked to a friend who is a therapist for wisdom, and he speculated that she might be suffering what he called learned helplessness. She had been taught for years that she could not change things at home, that she probably deserved what was happening to her, and that without this man, she was powerless in the world. I understood what he was saying, but it didn't ring true. I had met this woman. The woman who sat across from me in my office was not weak or ill-equipped, certainly not helpless. Judging by what she told me, she kept so many balls in the air during the day that she could have been a professional juggler. She was strong and organized and decisive. So why not leave if she felt the need? I had that conversation with her years ago in a galaxy far, far from here, but she has never been far from my memory. And I thought of her again this week when I read about an alternative explanation for why we might stay in tough places, why we might stay in a job that destroys us, why we might remain. It's called learned hopeful. That is, some people in difficult circumstances are able to stay, not because of helplessness, but because of hopefulness. They see some good in the person with whom they leave. They live, they see some progress in the relationships they are in. They can imagine a different outcome. For some people, it is hope that keeps them going back, not helplessness. To be sure, there is no single reason for any of our self-defeating behaviors, and we all have them. And I would never advise a person in danger to remain, but some choose to stay. Some choose to hope. 
In a world that makes so many of us feel helpless, there are a few among us who live lives of learned hopefulness. I wonder why the woman in today's gospel reading stayed. We don't know her age. We don't know her family situation. But we know that in spite of a crippling spinal condition, Luke writes, she was quite unable to stand up. She came to synagogue every Sabbath maneuvering around the courtyard vendors, skirting the rabbis huddled in corners with their students, negotiating the narrow hallway that led to the women's worship area. She saw none of it, eyes on the ground, leaning heavily on a cane. She was forced to meet the world literally head on, head down, head bowed. For 18 years, she saw nothing but feet and floors. Did she ever bother to wonder what it would be like to stand up straight? Clearly, at one time in her life, she had been able to do so. Did she ever wonder what it might be like to once again look someone in the eye, to greet the world with a smile rather than the part in her hair? Had she learned helplessness, living with her ailment? Or was she in synagogue because she had learned hope? Her true motivations will never be known. But I do know that though she saw nothing around her, Jesus saw her in the sea of worshipers on Sabbath. He picked her bent frame out of the crowd and said, With great effort, I imagine her like a crab, kind of sidling up to Jesus through the crowd. But with no effort at all, he straightened her. Be free. Be well. Stand up. He touched her. She snapped to attention like a West Point graduate and began to sing and to dance. Her life and her hope restored. I always like to give Jesus the benefit of the doubt, though I don't think he'd be much fun as a friend. I like to think that he performed his miracles out of the goodness of his heart and for holy purposes. But sometimes I think Jesus was just a jerk. He was just being difficult. The miracle he performed today was technically work, and he knew it. Work was prohibited on the Sabbath. And after all, what difference would one more day make to a woman who had been disabled for 18 years? Yet he chose to do this non-essential, unauthorized work in the middle of the synagogue on the Sabbath in full view of the synagogue leader. Though this miracle was clearly a gift to the woman bent double, I wonder if Jesus really just wanted to poke the synagogue leader in the eye. But there's more. Once Jesus had the attention of the whole synagogue, he poked him in the other eye, accusing him of having more compassion for beasts, for oxen, and for donkeys than for a disabled daughter of Abraham. The leader fumed, the crowd cheered, and the woman, she was gone, standing straight up, out the door, dancing, singing, all the way home. I bet she never sat another day in her life. So what brought the bent woman to synagogue that day? Surely no one would have thought less of her for staying home. We have all had days when just the thought of getting up, brushing our teeth, getting dressed, getting out of the house and into a public place leaves us sweaty and limp. Anybody else have those days? Sundays are often that way for me. But why wouldn't she be in synagogue? I don't think that though disfigured and disappointed, the bent woman had learned helplessness. I think she had learned. Perhaps her parents had taught her to be hopeful. 
Perhaps she never hoped for something as specific as a miracle of standing up straight. Who could ever imagine such a miracle? But she kept coming to synagogue to pray. She must have expected something. Clearly, for 18 disabled, painful years, she had never stopped hoping. Before I go on, let me say this again. There are circumstances in our lives when no amount of hope or faith can protect us. There are circumstances in our lives that may require us to be freed or to free ourselves. I would never advocate that we stay in a place that is dangerous to our bodies, our souls, or our minds. But we can all name people. Perhaps you are that person who have been able to choose hope over helplessness. People who under difficult circumstances live courageously and confidently, trusting, continuing to try. I think of the thousands of people damaged by sexual scandals in the church, many of whom have turned their backs on us. Can you blame them? But there are others, some seated in this room, who have seen a possibility of change, a promise of life, who continue to hope beyond hope that the church will be what Jesus meant the church to be. You have learned to hope. I think of migrants and refugees on every shore who, having fled violence and poverty in their home countries, look to us for safety and relief. They are not criminals. They are not low-life losers. They are desperate people praying that somewhere in the world they will find welcome. And many of them have chosen not to be helpless but to be hopeful. I think of the clients of the night ministry whom we are only now getting to know. The causes of homelessness are as many as the persons who are homeless. Helpless, some of them are. But can they learn? Can we teach them to be hopeful? The bent woman may have been little more than a ruse an excuse for Jesus to throw shade at the synagogue leaders. But she is more than that to us. Somehow in the midst of her sorrow, she kept finding reason to be hope, and beyond her wildest imaginings, that hope was rewarded. Together, in a world, and a country, and a city, and a church, and sometimes in our homes, hope is drained from us on a daily basis as if someone pulled the plug out of the bottom of our sink. Some are helpless, frightened, and alone. Can we, can they learn hopefulness? Can we help them to stand up straight as did the bent woman? Jesus breaks rules for the sake of the broken. Jesus lifts the fallen from their feet. Jesus teaches us, if we are willing to learn, to hope.